Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am the Professor of Ignorance at Southampton Cement University. I really am. I was there yesterday uh, overseeing the graduation of about a thousand students. Um, as far as I know, I'm the world's only professor of ignorance. I think. I don't have any duties, at least I don't know if I do, and I don't even know where my office is. My sole job as the professor of ignorance is to know that I know nothing. And though I am the professor of ignorance, a lot of people are a lot better at it than I am. Uh, for example, one in ten Americans think that HTML is a sexually transmitted disease. <laughs> or take this. Um, one of our young researchers at Q QI, which is what I, I've been doing for the last 14 years, is a lady called Ann Miller, and she has a friend who has a uh, she has a friend who's a vet in Belfast. He works for the PDSA, the People's Dispensary for Sick Animals, and because it's a free service, um, they have two main kinds of client at the PDSA in Belfast: sweet little old ladies who worry too much about their beloved pussy cats and so on and rough types with uh, pit bull terriers and the like, who are slightly taking advantage because, uh, by getting something for nothing. Anyway, one day Anne's friend, the vet, uh, gets a call from someone who said they were worried that their Rottweiler puppy wasn't growing properly. So with a heavy heart, the vet says, okay, bring, bring, bring it in, I'll, I'll have a look. And after a few moments examination of the animal, he said, I, I don't know how to break this to you, but your Rottweiler puppy is in fact a guinea pig. <laughs> this is the kind of thing we love at my Professor of Ignorance department. But listen, ignorant as I am, I know that these four things are true. Nobody knows anything, really, not at the base level. Nobody's better than anyone else. Anybody can find stuff out, and anybody can become somebody. There are three things I wish I'd been told when I was at school. Firstly, things are much more possible than you think. Secondly, that persistence is much more important than ability. And thirdly, that disaster is a gift. And disaster is a gift is what I want to slightly talk about, because I want to talk about some things that happened to me. When you get an, a lovely intro from people like Polly, there's a sort of thing going around that I must be some sort of different person. I'm some sort of genius, some sort of comedy legend. I often get introduced as, and this is completely ridiculous. I'm just a perfectly ordinary person who, who's just very bad at giving up uh, when a sensible person would. I tend to go on beyond the pain barrier. I don't know why. Uh, this is my main thing. I'm an extremely stubborn person. I don't like to come last. So I press on. Um, like many of you at school here, and many of you who left school, you probably might not know what you want to do. And uh, this has come up already a couple of times today. I certainly didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and I thought, because I was good at things like history and English, I shouldn't do those, because obviously, if it was easy, it, it must, mustn't be the real thing. So I decided to go to university to become a lawyer. Within two weeks, I realized I was going to make the world's worst lawyer. Uh, and in fact, I do have the worst third degree, cl third class degree in the history of the Cambridge Law Faculty. <laughs> I was really, really awful at it. So I sort of clocked off after a couple of weeks. And then I thought, well, I know really must, I really must go back and try. So I went to the nine o'clock lecture and, the, and, and on the Monday of the, the next week, and I was chewing my biro intently. Roman law, very keen, and it burst in my mouth, and I was <laughs> covered in blue ink like a smurf, and I had to leave, and I thought, this is a sign. <laughs> Whatever it is that runs the universe does not intend me to be a lawyer, so I, I left, and I never went back. Um, so, disaster is a gift. As a result of that disaster, I did everything else that Cambridge had to offer. So I had a wonderful three years. I tried to uh, be a student journalist, and I, I wrote the gossip column under the uh, pseudonym Ghoulies. 
And I used to get to invite all these parties because they knew I was on the staff of the university boat, but they didn't know I wrote the gossip column. So I used to write all these terrible stories about these awful things that happened at parties. Uh, and I was having a fantastic time. Got to a lot of parties and nobody knew who I was. And the editor, as a Christmas treat, thought I'd done so well, the column was so popular, that he'd print my name. <laughs> that Ghoulies is written by John Lloyd. Oh! So that was two years. The rest of the two years, I didn't get invited to any parties at all. <laughs> so I clocked off being a gossip columnist, and I decided that straight acting might be my thing. So I was in a play called La Machine Infernale by Jean Cocteau, which I'm sure some of you know is a really harrowing, very dark tragedy about the Oedipus myth, and I played um, Anubis, the jackal-headed god, in a papier-mâché dog's head. And uh, every time I came on, the whole audience collapsed in hysterical laughter, and I became a cult hit around the university. Go and see the asshole in the dog's head <laughs> in the cocktail. As a result of that, when I came to be in the Footlights Review, um, it was quite a good review that year, and we were due to go to the Edinburgh Festival and then the West End and the world, and I was going to become famous at the age of 21. And the director of Footlights took me aside and he said, John, I'm afraid we're going to have to fire you because you also have to be in the Chekhov play as well as the Footlights review to make the budget work, and we know what you did to the cocktail, and we can't afford to have you in the Chekhov, I'm afraid. So I was fired from that, and as a result, he, I started to cry. Um, and so he said, and said, you can go into radio, you can do a little radio show we're doing. And I was very depressed at the time that going into radio was, uh, w was the best I could manage. But I went into radio, age 22, I became a producer. Again, as a direct result of this, this disaster of being fired. And I spent the next 41 years in broadcasting. I've been fired more times than I can possibly think, seven times by Rowan Atkinson alone. Um, <laughs> it's getting to be quite a habit with us. I was fired by Douglas Adams from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, I was fired from Blackadder by uh, Ben Elton and Richard Curtis. So, you know, being fired is a good thing. It means it propels you into the next thing. Because if I hadn't been fired from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I would still be Douglas Adams' bitch today, probably. <laughs> but instead, because I had no job, I went to television and I got, uh, I got, uh, it's an extraordinary story this. I went to knock on the door of the head of light entertainment uh, television, hoping for a job as a trainee floor manager. And instead he offered me six programs as a producer. There was no pilot. And all I had to do was to agree to work with an insane young current affairs producer called Sean Hardy, who kept putting jokes into Panorama. Uh, and that's how Not the Nine O'Clock News began. Um, and the very first edition got five and a half million viewers and 30 telephone complaints. And this is what's known as jamming the BBC switchboard. <laughs> it's a tiny little switchboard they have there. Anyway, it broke, and so I was summoned to my head of department, and he said, uh, so John, Jimmy Gilbert, his name was, he was a famous television producer of his day, he produced The Frost Report many years before. So John, you jammed the BBC switchboard last night. 30 complaints. 30 complaints! Call yourself a satirist, it should have been 60, get out! <laughs> so, um, so the first time I was fired by Rowan Atkins was after Not the Nine O'Clock News, uh, when he said... Um, you, you guys are all really nice, uh, and I think you're very nice, but um, uh, you're just good people, and I'm the star, and I don't want to play with the second 11 anymore. Mm. <laughs> um, I didn't mean it amusingly at all. Uh, so uh, I went on to do uh, Spitting Image and Black Adder, as P Polly so kindly said, and um, by the time I was 38, let me think, yes, 38, 39, yeah. I won 10 BAFTA awards, which is uh, one less than Judy Dench, who's the world record holder. Um, but to me, my life looks like a succession of appalling disasters, to be perfectly honest, and just simply surviving all of them. For example, when I was 42, I woke up on Christmas Eve and I realized I couldn't see the point of everything, of anything at all. I had a terrible crisis. There's a thing that you get to uh, the impression at school, don't you, that there are 
one of the kids mentioned um, uh, Mozart. Okay, so there are extreme examples of extreme talent. Einstein wasn't like that. He was a bit uh, hopeless at school. Um, and if you are hopeless at school, that's also a very good thing because it's not always a good thing to be good at school because it means you're going to have to be a corporate lawyer or a man management consultant and earn millions of pounds and get terribly unhappy. <laughs> you're much better off, as somebody said earlier, the most important thing is to do what I did. My job is my hobby. I don't have a hobby because my hobby at university was writing jokes. That's what I discovered with all these other failures. The most important thing is to do something you love. And you might not find it at school. You might find it after school. Some people don't find it until they're 29 or 30 or even later. But the great thing about doing something you love is that um, you know, even if you're not paid very much, at least you'll enjoy yourself. And the other thing is that you also have a much greater chance of getting incredibly rich if you're doing something you really love, whether you're a rock guitarist or a painter or an entrepreneur. But the main thing is it's just important to do a, a good thing rather than, as somebody else said, that something that's important or well paid, that's, a, that's an absolutely terrible idea. And it is possible to make a good living doing something that you like. So I had this terrible crisis when I was 42 and I spent, after this glittering career and all these BAFTA awards, I spent literally 10 years failing at everything. I tried to start a radio station, they wouldn't give us a license. I wrote a movie, uh, the head of Paramount threw it in a swimming pool because the producer had delivered it late. It was literally 10 years of a disaster. And I started to struggle to find out what on earth could be, what really mattered, what's the point of everything. I was very anxious about my children. I worried about them all the time. I didn't know what to think about anything. And I started reading a lot of books. And I had this strange life directing cheese commercials by day, for which I was very well paid, and reading Spinoza, Heidegger, Nietzsche, and Epicurus in the evenings. And the more I read and the more books I bought, because I went all over the world as a commercial director, the more I thought, this is extraordinary. They didn't teach, teach me that at school, or this, or that. And after about 10 years, I thought, if I find this stuff this interesting, I'm sure other people will too. And so that is how QI started. Again, it started directly as a disaster from somebody who should have been happy at 42, had lots of money, children, a house, a flat in London, um, two cars. I had everything, but I wasn't interested. I was just going through the motions, earning money. And as a result of becoming interested as a, a lifesaver, I read a lot of philosophy and physics to try to understand what the meaning, what the point of everything is. If you want to come and ask me privately what it is, I'm very happy to tell you. Uh, <laughs> it's not very nice. <laughs> but uh, we've obviously at QI, we've asked ourselves literally tens of thousands of questions over the last um, 14 years or so. And I've come to the conclusion that there are only two questions that really matter. Why are we here and what should we do about it while we are? I don't have definitive answers this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm working on it. But as to the first question, why are we here? Here's what the great uh, uh, Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein had to say. He said, I don't know why we are here, but I'm pretty sure it's not in order to enjoy ourselves. <laughs> Slightly bleak, Teutonic uh, take there on, on life. And as to the second question, what should we do about it while we are? I'd like to quote one of my favorite poets, uh, the Anglo-American W.H. Auden, who was wont to say, we are here on earth to help others. What the others are here for, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody.